Welcome back. Welcome back. Are you hungry for more? Yes. I hope you are. The plenary session on number two is about to begin. Who or what makes the space between design and ethnography so anxious? There's probably few people out there that could answer to this question better than the founding director of the graduate program in transdisciplinary design at Parsons, the new school for design, Jamer Hunt. Let us give him a round of applause. Okay, everybody digested, had your okay, lunch. Now is, time, now is nap time. Um, so if you just want to take a little bit of rest, um, try not to close your eyes, uh, and uh, we'll see where we can go. But thank you very much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you so much to the organizers. What's going on? Uh, to the organizers of the event uh, for this invitation. And it's so extraordinary to be in Lisbon, uh, truly one of the world's most beautiful cities. Um, so uh, great pleasure. Just a little bit of explanation, because sometimes my titles don't explain much about the kind of work that I do uh, and where I do that. So um, many of you are probably familiar with Parsons School of Design. Uh, that is part of a larger university called the New School, uh, which was founded in 1919 in New York City as a progressive institution uh, embodying ideas of experimentation and social research. Um, eventually, in 1970, it merged with Parsons School of Design. Um, and so I was in uh, 2010 the founding director of the graduate program in transdisciplinary design at Parsons. And that was a program that was effectively um, looking at the world around us and asking the question of how design could play a role uh, in the sort of, um, you know, engagement with the complex systems uh, that were making our world more and more impossible to navigate. Um, and so it was a program that was not uh, bound to any single design discipline, but drew upon design as a process to address large-scale systemic issues. Um, and that's work that has, by and large, over the eight years of the program, sort of lived somewhat at the intersection of design and anthropology. Um, I, I do, in the past, have a, a doctorate in cultural anthropology, but I've been working and practicing in design for about 18 years. Um, and I'm what's called a recovering anthropologist uh, in the language of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and so uh, now I'm working uh, as vice provost at the new school uh, for transdisciplinary initiatives. So that's how do you bring together social research, design, policy management, performance in ways that can start to collide the disciplines together and find new ways of thinking. And so much of that work, you will see my presentation today is a bit of an argument for that kind of work um, through the lens of um, a sort of philosophical reflection upon the concept of the unknown. Um, so as I was getting ready to make this presentation, literally as I was building this presentation, uh, many of you build your presentations in PowerPoint or Keynote. I do happen to do mine in InDesign. And oh, this was not the, supposed to be the, uh, we updated this this morning. Um, huh, that was not. This is okay, I'm prepared for this moment. That's all right, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> so, as I was building this presentation, literally building it, taking this slide, and now I wanted to sort of move on to the concept of ignorance, um, and yet to do that, I had to first grab a square, sort of like stacked shipping containers, with a word in between, they grouped together in InDesign, and then I started to move that onto the next page, so I cut and paste the word between. I was gonna eventually move it to this, I was gonna center it, put the word ignorance in there instead of between. But what was fascinating to me, and if you'll ignore for a minute, right when I stand right here, uh, so you can't read this, I'll stand up further so you can't, really can't read it. Um, <laughs> is that doing anything? It's not very good. So um, that's not supposed to be there. Um, so what struck me was that in the shift from this slot, what? <laughs> That's all right, we're all okay. This is tricky. If the shift from this slide to this slide, as I was about to move this to the next slide, which was about ignorance, I realized something. That there was a between that I was talking about in the title of my talk, and I didn't know what between meant. What is between design and anthropology? Am I talking about 
practices that collide? Am I talking about disciplinary boundaries? Um, and am I talking about a conceptual space? And the reason that I bring this up is because part of what I want to argue for today is the importance and the impact and the power of materialization, of the making of things. In this case, it was the making of this presentation that landed this word between into my consciousness in a way that helped me to think through the problem of this presentation. And it's, so, it's that materialization to me that is so interesting about particularly design, and part of what I want to argue today is it's not just design, it's also anthropology, but it's in the materialization of the idea into the thing itself that one finds possibilities and capacity for new ideas and new thinking. So we'll move to ignorance. And what I want to do today is, in a sense, make an argument for ignorance. Or maybe, if not ignorance, at least something like that, not knowing. Um, because I think that there's an opportunity here to think through the ways in which these different practices, design and anthropology, um, deal in different ways with the idea of not knowing. And perhaps we can find some interesting way to combine them. Um, and this idea of not knowing, for me, uh, stems in particular from a quote that I'm uh, using all the time. So it goes like this. As we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. Some of you may recognize that quote. It's somewhat famous. Um, it's by Donald Rumsfeld. Um, now, don't worry that you missed a philosophy class and somehow you know, missed the sort of Rumsfeldian um, body of work. Uh, don't go Googling it right now. You won't find anything. Um, this is Donald Rumsfeld. Um, so here's a man um, standing next to Lord Voldemort. Um, <laughs> And Pinocchio, um, their boy puppet. Um, so Donald Rumsfeld was the Secretary of Defense uh, in the United States, um, one of the architects of the Iraq War, um, the fake Iraq War, except there were real casualties, uh, the war that was, let's say, trumped up. Um, and so Donald Rumsfeld was in a press conference, and he was asked about the fact that uh, the, the invasion of Iraq had recently started, and the U.S. was losing some troops due to the presence of uh, unexploded improvised explosive device, I mean, excuse me, exploded improvised explosive devices, IEDs. Um, and so when he was trying to give an answer as to why the U.S. military planning was not fully prepared for this, he went into this quote, this sort of soliloquy about, you know, epistemology um, to the press corps in this moment. Now, for me, a pacifist, uh, borrowing a quote from Donald Rumsfeld comes with a certain amount of pain. Um, I've been making a lot of uh, sort of progress, or hay with this, as they say. Um, I've been making a lot of this quote. Um, and in some ways, my idea is, can we turn this quote, which has, this was, I believe, said around 2002, it's been lingering in my head for 15 years. Can we take this quote and turn it into something more interesting, more useful? Can we subvert Donald Rumsfeld's words and turn it into something? So I thought, maybe I will graph it on a coordinate grid. And if I can graph this quote, maybe I can learn something about it. Um, the interesting thing is if you take this quote from Rumsfeld and start to play it out across this coordinate grid, what you discover is that the axes run from the known to the unknown and from the known to the unknown, which is probably tautological. Um, but nonetheless, it's already sort of an interesting problem. And then we can really chart what he says across this grid. So you have the known knowns in your upper left, the known unknowns in your bottom left, the unknown unknowns in your bottom right. And if you paid close attention to his quote, you might recognize that he left out really what is the hardest quadrant, which is the unknown knowns. OK, so he doesn't talk about those. Um, and in some ways, that's. Um, probably tells us something. So I began to think, um, if we took this framework and started to sort of map it onto the business of kind of knowledge creation, knowledge production, the making of things, if we took this framework, um, what could we learn from it? And so in some ways, the known knowns is sort of understanding. You know, it's the knowledge that we've built up. 
This is the hardest one, the unknown knowns. And the best that I could come up with was the idea of reflection, the idea that you have a kind of intrinsic knowledge that you don't quite know, but perhaps upon reflection, you learn that you knew it all the time. And I'd be happy to take questions about this, and I'd be happy for be better definitions of it. The known unknowns is really a, it's, it's sort of the world most of us work in. It's the world of research. It's the idea that you have a question uh, that you have been able to frame, been able to shape, and that question is leading you from the known to the unknown. This is what a hypothesis does. It takes us from the known to the unknown. It frames the unknown for us so that we can find it in order to explore it. So we're familiar with the unknown knowns. And then the unknown unknowns to me is something like discovery or surprise. Um, it's really a category that's much more interesting um, to deal with. And so it also, and as I was starting to think, because discovery for me feels like, and you know, I come from the design world, and so I'm much more comfortable um, with the sort of language of discovery and of newness and innovation and things like that. Um, but within this, I think in terms of anthropology, and we heard a little bit about this this morning, um, that field work can become this kind of space of discovery, this encounter with a radical other, this sense in which you put yourself on the line for things you can't expect or predict. And so field work has this capacity, provided that we think of field work not always as simply going to some other place to study some other people, but we think of field work informed by actor network theory, informed by object-oriented ontology, as including things like microchips and the production of microchips, or our understanding of our relationship to the microbiome, or to mushrooms in forests. That these are all spaces for field work. So we can start to map this across these different domains and start to understand the ways in which we all engage in different ways with the known and the unknown. And then if we tried to, in a sense, map anthropology as a discipline across that, you might get something like this. It tends to live over in that world of sort of knowledge, understanding, and research. It drifts a bit into reflective practice and somewhat into discovery in the fieldwork practice. But by and large, I think, you know, we would think of anthropology as a sort of research practice. Design might have a slightly different shape and might live in a slightly different part of the grid. And so here we have this kind of um, overlap, of course, but design perhaps being a little bit more space of exploring the unknown unknowns, of creating kind of ways to get to the new um, with all the problems that we could describe for the new. Uh, so then we have the between. It was the between that kind of came to me only because of my mistake, only in my mistake of making this presentation did I really start to think about what it was in the between or what that space opens up for us in terms of a kind of conceptual set of possibilities. Well, I love thinking about these sorts of things, and this quote is brilliant for me. And it really goes to this question of the unknown, which I want to pursue further. So this is from Robert Proctor from a book called Agnotology. Agnotology is the study of ignorance or what we don't know. A key question then is, how should we regard the missing matter, knowledge not yet known? Is science more like the progressive illumination of a well-defined box, or does darkness grow as fast as the light? This is such a beautiful quote. And that progressive illumination of a well-defined box needs a little bit of an explanation. So it's really this idea that with the production of knowledge, we are thinking in sort of finite ways about the world, that the world is full of things that we can know. So imagine you're in a dark room, there is no light, you have a flashlight, and you're progressively shining that flashlight around the room in order to reveal the room in its fullness. That's a very different notion than the idea that darkness grows as fast as the light. And I think we live in a moment not only that darkness in a political sense is growing faster than the light, um, but really this idea that um, it's not just the simple notion that the more you know, the less you know. That's part of it, for sure. But it's as if in producing knowledge, we produce kind of not knowing at the same time, new things that we don't understand by producing what we do understand. And it's that kind of dialectical tension that I'm interested in. This is, you know, a slide that describes uh, the progressive illumination of a well-defined box. This is obviously the genetic tree of life. And it is an attempt to understand everything in the world by finding a place for it within a system, within a framework. 
This is the progressive illumination of a well-defined box. The more knowledge we have, all of that knowledge is kind of connected, and the more we build that, eventually we'll sort of figure things out somehow. And it often takes this sort of form of a kind of hierarchical taxonomy with orders and suborders and hierarchies and relations of things to each other, systems and subsystems of knowledge. You can think of that central box as French poetry, and then you might want to know the symbolists and the surrealists, and within the surrealists, you would read André Breton and you know, maybe Baudelaire and Rimbaud even as early precursors, and those would fill the column. We're very good at this, and in fact, we're so good at this in education but I always, what I like about this particular diagram is that at the same time that it can stand in for taxonomy, it's often what a classroom looks like in terms of the seating plan. It's often what a conference looks like in terms of the presentation format. In other words, we live in this world of knowledge where we sort of, we have built in the expectations around this way of knowing. But I think we're moving more towards this way of knowing. That if we want to understand knowledge as you know, the dark growing as fast as the light, that the kind of rhizome, that the network becomes a more effective metaphor, let's say, for thinking through the ways in which things build, where nodes are related in relation to contiguity, scale, movement, etc., rather than the sort of hierarchical, um, clearer forms of connection. We probably live in something that looks more like this today, um, which is some hybrid of these two things. You know, and what's interesting to me, what, why you know, I want to suggest this image is, it's the idea in a sense of knowledge and its undoing at the same time. So how do we think through the ways in which we can both build knowledge and critique knowledge at the same time to make things and undo them, that the darkness grows as fast as the light? And this is my favorite example, this is a painting by Julie Moretu, of exactly the sort of world that I think we live in right now. And when uh, uh, Sarah Pink earlier today was describing wicked problems, this is sort of the best visualization of wicked problems. Because within this you see this tension between kind of order and disorder at the same time. And it's amazing that she does this. And these are, if you've never seen Julie Moretu's paintings, they're, um, they're about this size actually. Um, in relation to the human body. And so there's a fantastic sense in which you're enveloped in this space that seems to embody both order and its disordering at the same moment. And that's kind of the moment, I think, that we live in right now. And so, you know, we can create these kind of binaries. I'm not that comfortable with them, but perhaps, you know, we are living in the between of these, uh, between expertise and connection, between the vertical and the horizontal, between framing things as knowledge versus framing things as project. Teaching, going from that didactic model of filling a student with your knowledge to one of co-creating. Research moves to discovery. The enlightenment period moves to a period of decolonization. The credentialed, those who have the right, who have the official designation to speak and to be expert and to know moving into a more open space, and certainly the, you know, the internet has helped with that. But the library as this kind of repository of knowledge ordered through systems of numbering in which everything has a relationship to each other, moving to the idea of the studio, the kind of place of production of new ideas, or the system in the mechanical engineering 20th century sense, moving perhaps to the idea of the ecosystem, the biological in the 21st century sense. And in the work that I do in the transdisciplinary design program and in my teaching really all over, really has to do with looking at systems thinking, um, not as systems borrowed from the kind of mechanical metaphors of human computer interaction and the military, which is actually where a lot of systems thinking came out of, but systems thinking as borrowing from ecosystems and biological systems. And so for me, design is something that lives right at this uh, sort of fruitful intersection between ecological systems, technological systems, and social systems. And that you can't disentangle those in any one moment. So, I'm excited about the unknown unknowns, 
And I guess the next, next question would be how to create the unknown unknowns. Problem is you can't. That's research. Creating the unknown unknowns is saying, I know what the problem is, how do you get to the answer? So you can't create the unknown unknowns. But what you can do is you can create the conditions of possibility for the unknown unknowns to emerge. And that's the form of practice that I'm interested in, both with anthropology and design, the ways in which you can construct and frame encounters in such a way that things can emerge that you cannot predict and cannot expect. And that's not an easy thing to do. It takes time. It takes the right conditions. It's a bit like growing a garden. You can hope that your plants will take root and live and thrive and produce or grow, but you never know. But you can, so you can create these conditions of possibility. So how do you do that? Here are some ways. I certainly don't know all of the ways, um, but I'll suggest a few and you can add some. First, not surprisingly, collide disciplines in collaboration. And we heard a bit about that this morning as well. And it's the idea of this crash of epistemologies. And when you have worked in teams you know, with a biologist and a designer or an anthropologist and a fine artist or whatever the combinations are, you inevitably encounter this moment where you thought you were talking about the same thing and you find out that you weren't. And that your language is not even the same. The language games we play are not even the same. But what's interesting to me is that gap in communication. It's in those gaps that actually new ideas start to bubble up and emerge. I often love the idea of mistranslation. So it's the idea that, well, there's something was said. I, I was once at a conference with biologists and architects. And the architects were really interested in biology. This was 15 years ago. So for you know, just the beginning years of kind of um, genetic algorithms and uh, other forms of uh, architectural design that were based upon kind of natural metaphors. And so the architects were fascinated by the biologists and really wanted to understand them. The biologists were uh, a little surprised that they were of interest to the, the architects, but they're happy to be there. Um, and so what was amazing was you could just hear over the course of the day the fact that the architects didn't really understand the biologists, and the biologists really didn't understand the architects. But in that mistranslation, new concepts could emerge that were neither right for one or right for the other, but some sort of synthesis of the two that was, didn't have to do in the end with right or wrong, but with the emergence of something unknown, of a space of possibility between those things. And it didn't matter whether they were right or not. So it's in those sort of spaces, in those cracks in discourse, in those collisions of epistemology, that you get the opening of a space of possibility for the unknown to emerge. I also find that you can decentralize authority and control. So if this is something that I've learned through you know, being in very, various kind of leadership positions, administrative positions, uh, team positions, um, even in the control of my software. I lost control of my software in building this presentation. That's why I got between in the wrong place. And I really lost control because then I left comments on I shouldn't have. But somehow those end up, if you are sort of open to that possibility, those end up being ways in which you can reveal things to yourself that the making, the translating of the ideas in your head into form in the world can reveal possibilities that you didn't know were there. And you have to do that by sort of getting rid of that sense of authority, of agency. I've known as a program, an academic program director, the program I directed worked best when I did the least. Now, you might just say that I'm a bad director. Uh, and th there's an argument for that. Um, but it's really the fact that when I was able to create the right conditions where faculty are empowered to teach the things they want to do and students felt integrated and part of the curriculum and could help shape their experience, that things could happen in that space that had I wanted to exert more control, we would have lost those. We, wouldn't, we never would have found new directions to go in in that program. But because it was open enough, things could emerge. And so it's very hard to give up control. It's very hard to give up agency. But the sooner that you can do that, other things can happen. The next is to encourage mutation through experimentation. Most of mutation in nature happens at the edges of biomes, where you get that mutation. But you have to bring things together. You have to give them the space to experiment. 
And so again, I think uh, what Sarah said this morning about the kind of experimental methods of anthropology have to evolve, this is the opportunity. This is the moment for it when these disciplines are coming together. And you know, part of what I want to sort of build towards in this argument is the sense in which our lack of knowing, the sort of unknown unknowns about each other's disciplines end up leading to a kind of formularization of our methods. And you have to resist that. You have to bring these things together, collide them, and find new ways that might not work. But it's only in when you get to that moment of this might not work. You know, it's always, I always find the, the moment is predictable. It's one where you can sort of see a possibility and it scares you. And you have to go towards it rather than away from it. Because if you go towards it, towards the scary thing that you can't understand, that's more likely to be interesting than staying with what you know. So you have to have that formal, constant experimentation. This is, of course, how evolution works. This is explicitly a kind of evolutionary metaphor. That it's this idea of lots and lots of assays, lots and lots of experiments. And this is why, when we say the conditions of possibility take a long time, you can't predict. If you try and predict what that outcome will be, then you've sort of already lost the openness that you needed. So how do you encourage that mutation through experimentation? And finally, go back to my mistake in the beginning, you have to make things. You have to put things into the world. The world in our mind exists in one form, but only when it takes form does it start to resonate with the people around us. That's what design does so well, is it takes ideas and puts them into the world as an offering for others to critique, to challenge, to ridicule, to adopt, to change. But you have to put it out in the world. It's that moment of making that's so important to the process, and I see this over and over and over again with my students who are dealing with really complex problems, and all they want to do is more research, because everything they make is not commensurate with the complexity of the world that they see, so they just want to do more research and learn more and more and more and more, and I tell them, you have to stop. Stop knowing so much and start making things, not because you know what you're going to make and not because what you make is going to be the answer, but because that making is an opening into a different space. It involves the body. It involves accident. It has a phenomenology to it that's different than thinking. And the other, you know, the, there's a, a kind of a fifth way, um, and it's going for a walk, you know, <laughs> taking a shower. Um, I often find that, so I'm a runner, so I'll go on a long run, and it's only when my mind relaxes enough and I've stopped thinking about what I want to think about that suddenly solutions and ideas will come to me that I never knew that I knew. And so what scares me about this present moment in both design and anthropology, and we heard lots of reasons this morning to be anxious about the world around us, but what scares me is the ways in which we are leaning upon methods as security against risk. And so if you Google design thinking and you look at images, this is what you get, and it's extraordinary. You know, it's, uh, it's colorful. Um, but all of these ways in which people are trying to, you know, sort of turn what is a process, uh, a complicated process, into a simple one, of taking something that involves the unknown and turning it into the known. And if you have spent much time with designers, what you very quickly learn is that everybody's process is different. There is no formula. I was giving a lecture once, and Ed Fella, who's a type designer, uh, was at this, uh, and he was sketching the whole time in his book. And I was a big admirer of his work, and afterwards I thought, oh, Ed, you know, I'd love to see what you sketched, because it must be related to what I was talking about. <laughs> and he, of course, said no, uh, <laughs> that he had some random words, and he just sketches the type of those random words while he's listening to somebody. That's his method. It doesn't go through these stepwise functions of divergent and convergent. It had no kind of formula to it. And in the same way that designers are desperate for anthropological methods, my students, they just want a little bit of ethnography. They can just get a little bit of ethnographic methods. That's all they need to figure out how to understand the user or the population or the community they're working with. But we lose something in this sort of formulization of knowledge and practice. And here it is in service design. Let's turn it into a formula. You pick one of this, and this is a menu. You pick some of these, and eventually you're doing service design. Now, 
the one thing I really don't want to do is I don't want to fetishize design here. Uh, somehow designers are, you know, creative types and, um, and we, you know, we need that freedom in order to think. What I'm talking about today exists in all of us. It's, for, it's sort of turned into practice in different ways through anthropology and through design. But I think that, you know, the attempt to turn these practices into steps and functions and things is really, to me, um, missing this opportunity. I mean, it, it's served a lot of people and it's done a lot of good, but it's also missing something. And that's what I want to get at in this kind of unknown unknown. So this is another, you know, sort of favorite version of this. And this is exactly uh, what's wrong with uh, contemporary notions of design. It's this idea that somehow you move through this kind of craziness pattern in research, through uncertainty, insights, et cetera, you get to the concept and boom, you've landed it. Straight shot to the end, bullseye. All you need is the concept and you've got it, right? I would like to actually flip that on its head um, and think about design in a different way, which is in the beginning you sort of think you're on top of the world. You think you understand what the project is. And then you start to freak out because you know that there's so much more to this problem, that it's systems built upon systems, it's turtles on top of turtles all the way down. And then you get into exploration and it gets even sort of wilder. And ideation starts to become almost impossible. And then the one thing that I think designers do so well in my years of working within the field <laughs> is this material exploration, is this willingness to try 10, 15, 20, 100 versions of something. And they don't do that because it's good practice, although it is good practice. They do that because at some point, you lose track of what you know. You lose track of your ideas. You've expressed all of your ideas. You've walked right up to the edge of what you know. And then the question is, what do you do next? And if you only materialize something once, if you only kind of come to its understanding once, you're backing away from that edge. But if you want to leap, you have to go more into it, more into it. When I write, as a practice, I commit to writing a thousand words a day. And the reason that I do that is because, uh, one, it allows me to quit by like one o'clock in the afternoon if I've done well that day, so that's nice, and then I can, you know, go for a run or make dinner. Um, but more importantly is the days when I have only written 600 words and I have no idea what to lef what's left to write. And so I start like banging on the typewriter and I commit myself to sitting there and typing out more words. I cannot tell you how many times that that moment has been a moment where an idea has surfaced that was never part of the work, that I had never thought through, but that suddenly reorients the work in a profound way. And that's the process of making that I'm so interested in. That's the process of form giving, of design, that's so interesting to me, is that in this materialization, in this using of the body, and the way the body translates through physical form in the world, that you can start to reveal things to yourself that you didn't even know you knew. Perhaps those are the unknown knowns. Just to give you an example, um, this is a project by um, uh, the company OXO. It was done with Smart Design. Um, and this is a very kind of famous, iconic design project. Um, and so it was the design of a potato peeler. And the idea was we used to use these sort of, sort of stamped metal potato peelers that really hurt, especially if you're peeling a lot of potatoes. They were just a thin metal band with the a, um, with a peeling part. And so uh, Smart Design um, was hired to create a potato peeler for people with arthritis. And so you can see in the first kind of model on the left, you know, they come up with a wider handle that's smooth, so it's more comfortable. And then by the next iteration of the model, they've included all of these little sort of flanges, all this sort of um, texture. The thought being, well, people are working in the kitchen, their grip strength is not very strong, and you know, this will keep the water away from the hand so you don't get that slipperiness of it while it's in your hand. And then they move on. They re realize that maybe they should move those little grippy things towards the top. It doesn't have to be over the whole thing. Uh, then you look and you see that the, you know, the, the, suddenly the handle is shortened quite a bit. And again, I, wanna, you know, I sort of want to get back to this notion of what happens in design. What this one misses is it thinks that once you've got the concept of the potato peeler, you just kind of, you're done. But what we see in a project like this is that 
the iteration over and over again of slight variations in the exploration of form, and you look between the white one and the black one next to it, almost no difference, slight difference in length. And it moves again, it increases in length, and now they've added the mechanism for peeling the potatoes. And you'd think that one's gotta be just about perfect, but then for reasons that I don't understand, maybe it was manufacturing, manufacturing cost, maybe it was ergonomics, uh, the final one is slightly longer, the blade is slightly longer. That's how you design. It's through that exploration and materialization that you get there. But the most interesting thing about this project is the fact that uh, those little grippy things up there, do you know why they stayed? They stayed because people like to go with their thumb. <laughs> they didn't help in gripping, but people love to just play with them and go and that's why they stayed. And you wouldn't have ever discovered that except that you started to make it that way and you realized it didn't work for what you thought. You had an unknown known. How do we make it textured so it doesn't slip in the hand? And you explored that. But what you didn't know was that eventually that was gonna make this thing fun. And just a little bit of whimsy and an artifact that is used for the most prosaic of tasks. Or the post-it note. I mean, we think of the post-it note as the kind of icon of design thinking, um, as a sort of instrumental uh, way of organizing the chaos of creativity. This is how you use the post-it note. <laughs> you know, this is turning the form of the post-it note into something utterly unexpected. Or this project, which was in the subways of New York just after uh, the new president of the United States um, <laughs> was elected. And it became the source of emotional connection in a city that is often missing that emotional connection. So it became a way for people to speak out, to reach out, and the materiality of it, it grew and grew and grew and grew, and it was incredible because even subway workers were not taking it down initially. And it grew and grew and grew because people felt this sense of place and connection at a moment when they were scared. And they wanted to see that amazingly huge expanse, was seeing the roar of New York City, saying, listen to us, we're not gonna live with this. Or this project, which I did with some students, and they were exploring in a speculative design studio class that I was co-teaching, um, the idea that you could, uh, they were trying to think about what happens when land fills get full up. What happens when we can't throw things away anymore? And what happens to our relationship to objects? And they, they were trying to construct the scenario in their head, and they were trying to build this sort of screenplay for this little movie. They had to sort of make a movie with this. And so they're trying to construct this, and they, uh, they said, we just, it's not coming together. We, we just can't understand how this, you know, the story is going to take form. We want it to deal with this issue and this issue and recycling and all this sort of stuff. And they showed us sort of these, the, the first still. They'd gone out to this strange part of New York City called Dead Horse Bay and taken some pictures and sort of, and, and we looked at them and said, stop with the planning. Just go there. Go to that space and let that space tell the story for you. Because what was happening in that space was that it was disgorging, it was burping up plastic remnants from the 1930s and the 1940s. Because of Hurricane Sandy, it had compromised the landfill, landfill and that was losing its products. And those products had been compressed and melted by the heat. And that they had this extraordinary space where they, they could just let the location tell the story, try not to control it, but let the location tell you what the story should be, not you try and control that story. And so they were able to explore the space between kind of past and present, barring kind of the old and the new. And what I loved about this project, our designers in our program are often very sort of conservative. They want to change the world. They want to do things that are serious, that have value, you know, that make a difference. And they really lack a sense of that exploration of form for form's sake even. And so it's these gold gloves to me that I love. It's this one touch that takes you into a very different time gives you a different kind of temporal reality between the costume, the eyeglass, and the gold gloves. And suddenly it creates a world that might not have been there otherwise. So it's in these kind of practices of the between. It's in opening up this space of possibility, not in turning anthropology into a set of research methods, not in turning design into a set of methods. Sure, that's useful work. And a lot of us are here because of that work. And I have had 
the luxury of a wonderful career because Tim Brown made design thinking popular. So I'm not ignorant of, you know, sort of the, who feeds me in this world. Um, he floated the boats in such a way that we could create a program that he probably never knew would have existed. Uh, and yet, you know, it exists in part because design thinking has been so persuasive. But can we resist those moments of trying to button down knowledge and the creation of knowledge? Can we look at that space between as a space of possibility of the unknown unknown? Can we create those conditions of possibility where experiments can allow things to open up? And I would say, and just to conclude, that in some ways, for me, one of the things that we don't look at in anthropology is the act of writing. We think of it as a translation device between my brain and the thing in front of me. But that's the wrong way to look at it. And I think what we've heard earlier today and what I really want to emphasize is this idea of, you know, sort of mutation through experimentation to try these methods. Why have we not seen the great ethnographic monograph that's hypertext with multiple voices? Why is that experiment not happening? How do we get outside of ourselves in this field? But I think we can pay attention to this form of writing, this notion of writing, as a form of making. It's the materialization that made me make the mistake of the word between to help me to understand what I was going to talk about today. And so two quotes from two writers. One is Teju Cole, a great essay if you, if you like. It's very short, but it's incredible. The White Savior Industrial Complex about the political challenges of, um, you know, sort of design, development, trying to change and save the world. But he writes, my goal in writing a novel is to leave the reader not knowing what to think. I think of that as a really interesting provocation to the kind of work you need to do. What happens if your work leads to someone not knowing? Or this from an essay called Why I Write by Joan Didion, which if you like writing, or if you like Joan Didion, you have to read this. It's scintillating. I, would have I almost thought about just reading the whole essay um, here. I write entirely to find out what I'm thinking, what I'm looking at, what I see, and what it means. And pay attention to that inversion there. She writes to find out what she sees. She doesn't write to translate what she saw. She writes to find out what she sees. And so it's in that practice of materialization, it's in the making that you've opened up the space of possibility for the unknown unknowns. So I'll leave you with this quote, the poor pedestrian abilities of a fish are clearly explainable in terms of his excellence as a swimmer. It's a weird sentence, I'll read it again. The poor pedestrian abilities. So the inability of a fish to walk is clearly explainable in terms of his excellence as a swimmer. If you're gonna be a great swimmer, you're probably not gonna be a great walker. A way of seeing is also a way of not seeing. A focus upon object A involves a neglect of object B. So every time we turn our research, ga research gaze towards object A, what we're not seeing is object B. And it's that object B behind us, around us, under us, under us that I'm so interested in. That's not Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> that was Kenneth Burke. Thank you very much. <laughs>